question. I'm now recording and I'm going to share my screen. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I think uh, absolutely right. Uh, yes, the, uh, the lecture today will be pretty much uh, in the same uh, vein. Uh, thank you very much, Bernardo, for uh, the, the link on Moodle. Again, a big round of applause for Bernardo. He is absolutely, what, what would we do without him? Seriously, this is, it makes my life so much easier. Uh, so if you can, please do record your attendance. <laughs> and I love uh, his uh, gifts. Uh, that's absolutely wonderful. It puts a little bit of a light note to everything. By the way, can you see my screen? The nucleic acids, the future. Can you see that? Ah, lovely. Excellent. Because that's what we are going to do uh, today. And hopefully I still can uh, keep people interested and, uh, you know, in a way almost uh, passionate about things. Because what we are going to do, uh, what we are discussing in this session is really the future and how it um, how it will uh, affect everybody. And uh, do you have to make notes? Well, if you want to, uh, the session is recorded. The slides uh, are, are on, on Moodle. And also uh, it is all on YouTube as well with the link to the slides. Um, and uh, there are lots of videos actually uh, in these slides as well additional videos. So I think you really, a good bioscientist, need to be aware of the things that we are going to discuss in this session. Because as I said, uh, it will, it does have a huge implication for basically everybody. And for you as the, as the future scientists, because it will also provide you with some, uh, moral dilemmas, no doubt about that. So I just give it another minute or two uh, for everybody to uh, come in and then we kick off. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that's that's a very interesting comment, Va. Um, maybe uh, we can sort of have a, a little bit of a discussion at another point about uh, ethics. Okay, let's make a start. Let's get the first of um, of these three sessions out of the way. Mind you, I don't really count the last one from uh, five to six because that's going to be just a bit of fun lecture about the biochemistry of Christmas. But before we go there, let's talk about nucleic acids and the future. And really what I want you to present here is uh, really an, a very brief overview of new technologies that are have been already established and that are emerging and how they can address uh, problems, but also create new ones. 
And I think I would like to start with the this uh, thing that I discussed yesterday, uh, this uh, sequencing method discovered by or established by Frederick Sanger, who I showed uh, a picture of you and who I mentioned yesterday, uh, who be, uh, who received a Nobel Prize for this Sanger sequencing. And this was actually an, a total, how shall I say, revolution uh, in uh, around 1977 when it started, because uh, it kick-started the Human Genome Project, uh, the HGP. And I briefly mentioned that it started in 1990. And it was designed to produce the first complete DNA sequence of a, a human uh, with all the estimated three billion bases. And this was an an a tremendous undertaking. It was uh, People um, had this project uh, limited until about 2005. And the budget for that was set to three billion US dollars. And it was really a proof of concept. Can we do that? Do we have the technologies? Uh, is it feasible? And one of the things that had, we had already uh, at our hands was this method of Sanger sequencing. How can we sequence a piece of DNA quite reliably? And Frederick Sanger, who I think was an absolutely extraordinary man, as I said, not only did he win uh, two Nobel Prizes, but uh, he also was suggested for a knighthood. Um, and he turned it down because he said, look, I'm just an ordinary person. Uh, people who get knighted will change. And I honestly don't want to change. And one famous quote from Frederick Sanger is, I'm just an ordinary chap messing about in the lab. I think this uh, this humility is absolutely mind blowing. But what did he what did he sort of invent invent? What did he come up with? He came up with this method of uh, sequencing and to determine actually the sequence of uh, a DNA strand. And let's say we have a very simple DNA strand A A A. T, 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 C, C, C. So this here would be our uh, five prime end. This would be the three prime end. And we want to determine the sequence of this DNA strand. And it's uh, incredibly simple. Uh, with uh, the old method, which was developed by Maximum Gilbert, uh, it was a chemical breakage uh, method where you had uh, a single strand. You, you had to work with a single strand and where you introduced statistical breaks after introduced by chemicals. And, uh, and uh, this break would be either here or here or here. And then in another reaction, it would be a break here, here, here. And then in a third reaction, there would be a break here, here, here. Uh, and you can't have a break here. And these were statistical breaks and they made different uh, sized DNA fragments. But it was incredibly messy and you had to have radio labeled DNA for that. And uh, that's that's usually not a really nice thing to work with, radio-labeled stuff. So uh, Sanger came up with another method, and he um, used a DNA polymerase uh, to, to do this reaction. So he uh, 
like you did with uh, PCR. It's uh, the principle is very, very similar to PCR. Um, I just uh, write it the, the other way around now. Because that makes it then easier. So here would be the three prime. Here's the five prime. You use a primer like you used. And then you uh, just and you use only one primer, so you don't amplify the whole thing. And what you then do is you use a DNA polymerase, which uses this strand that you want to sequence as a template, and then you add your nucleotides. So far, so good. So you would use the DNA polymerase would attach a G here, would attach another G, G, A, 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 T. And then the trick that Sanger introduced was he used special, specially modified nucleotides. Now, what did he use? So let's just simply draw a, a box standard DNA base. So let's say we have an A here. Here we've got the CH2, and we have the three phosphates here. So because we have DNA, we only have an OH group here, and this would be, this A would get incorporated, right? So let's go back a little bit. So here this A would get incorporated. And as you have seen that for uh, the uh, for your PCR practical that you have done. So we would get this as the next A. Now what Sanger did was he modified this base here and he attached a fluorescent dye to it. So what he could do was he could make this DNA every time or often when an A is incorporated, um, this, DN, this fluorescent uh, nucleotide will be incorporated. So you can make the DNA fluorescent. And in this case, it is labeled on the A's. And uh, you don't want to do that for every single one, for every single A that you incorporate. You just simply mix this together with the normal A's. Like that. So that is a not a uh, labeled A, and what you get is a statistical incorporation of this fluorescent labeled A into your DNA strand. So you get a strand. But how can this be used for DNA sequencing? Well, here comes the absolute genius of Sanger, because what he did is he put in another modification in this fluorescent labeled nucleotide. What he actually did was he removed this OH group and replaced it with the H. So this here is the three prime precision, one, two, three prime, and that's the usual five prime precision. What will happen if you add this, what is called the di deoxy uh, A. What will happen when the polymerase incorporates this di deoxy into our new strand? What do you think will happen? Absolutely right. We will 
we will get absolutely right. We will get a termination. We will incorporate this A here, where it should be, and it is labeled. Oops. We incorporate that here and it is labeled. But the polymerase then can no longer add any additional A's. Now, if you mix these two together, the dideoxy plus the normal D ATP, then you get a statistical incorporation. Not every A will be fluorescent labeled at the end here. You might get another A attached here. Well, not in this case. Hang on, I need to remove that. So, for some strands, the first A will already be the end of the sequence. For another strand, the first A that we incorporate will be the normal ATP, and then the second one, the second one is our fluorescent labeled one where it is stopped. So what you get is actually different strands of DNA of different lengths and they are labeled right at the end with this green fluorescent dye and you know that always at the end there is an A. And now what you can also do is you can use another another dye that labels the G's. So you get a G here. So you get different strand lengths. And you know that if it's green at the end, it's an A. If it's red, it's a G. If it is blue, it is a C. And if it's yellow, it's a T, for example. You can use different, different strand lengths. And now all you need to do is separate these strand lengths, these sep separate these strands. And you know how you can separate strands. How, how would you, how would you, oops, where did that come from? How can you separate DNA strands by size? What method have you learned for that? How do you separate strands? Temper uh, separate uh, separate separate the different sizes. Yes, electrophoresis. And what you can do in this case with electrophoresis, you don't use well, you use something akin to a gel. It's a very very thin tube. It's uh, actually a capillary. I should do that like that. In this capillary, there is a gel, and you do electrophoresis of the whole thing. And this capillary separates the strands, and the resolution is so good that it can separate them according to their length 
And the difference can be just one base. It's so accurate. And what you might end up with is you probably have a red one here. Let me draw this a little bit bigger. So you can separate the different sizes. Let's do it like that. And let's take a blue one. So here we said this one was an A, G, A, and let's do this a C. So you know that the shortest strand would be the sequence C, A, G, A. So that would be the sequence of this piece of DNA that you get out. And what you just simply do is you look at what comes out at the end with a laser and with a photo detector at the other end. And you check what is the color that comes out from this, uh, from this uh, capillary electrophoresis. And this then gives you the sequence of your DNA fragment that you are looking at. And with this Sanger method, you can read, say, easily 300 to, on a good day with the wind blowing in the right, dire right direction, 900, 900 uh, bases. You can really easily read that in a, such an uh, experimental uh, setup. And uh, you can determine your DNA sequence. Of course, what you need to do is, if you've got a huge genome to map, obviously, is you need to get these things overlapping. So let me create some space here. Go away. So what you need to do is you sequence one bit of your DNA strand, and then you sequence another strand. And you have to make sure that you've got some overlap in it, in these strands, because then you have to put them together like a puzzle. And that was really a massive, massive task for the Human Genome Project, because the Human Genome Project originally used exclusively this Sanger sequencing method. And um, there was, for example, and, and this was the Human Genome Project was an uh, effort uh, of uh, loads and loads of different uh, laboratories worldwide. They were sort of connected. And uh, certain laboratories did, for example, chromosome 13, others did chromosome 21, uh, all these things. And they had sequencing machines. So you, you needed a special sequencing machine that did all this thing because you needed the uh, electrophoresis and all, this, uh, all these things. Uh, these uh, sequencing machines are not cheap. Uh, we are talking about uh, several hundred thousand pounds per machine, but people considered it worth the, the uh, effort. So, for example, I did a course in 2001 where the project was uh, in its heydays. Uh, I did a course in Cambridge at the Sanger Center in, in Hingston. And they showed us a hall that had about two or three hundred of the sequencing machines that were constantly running 365 days a year, 24 hours. And they had dedicated technicians who restocked the, um, the, the, the chemicals and uh, these uh, sequencing machines produced the human genome sequence, these three billion. And of course, you have to uh, do the sequencing several times. 
in order to uh, avoid any, um, you know, if you've got uh, somewhere um, uh, an error or something like that, or it doesn't work. It was a gigantic, gigantic effort to uh, get this human genome uh, sorted. It is estimated that the first genome that was sequenced, totally sequenced, uh, was done at a cost of roughly, so the first, first human genome was around um, 500 million to 1 billion uh, US dollars. That was the cost for the first genome. And of course, that's, you know, if you want to do more than uh, these things, then uh, you, you, have to, you have to do something about it. Uh, and, but what we learned from it was how we can automate this sequencing of uh, DNA and then how to use computers to put together this uh, puzzle of, you know, uh, millions of pieces and make sense of it. So that was the Sanger sequencing, an extraordinary uh, effort. However, people then thought, well, actually, we want it cheaper. We don't want to spend one billion US dollar for one human genome to be sequenced. It would be great if we could do it cheaper. And new technologies uh, came up. Uh, particularly next generation sequencing. And actually, you don't need any heists for that because the next generation sequencing, uh, particularly by a company called Illumina, They uh, entered the, uh, the market around the 2000s. So uh, quite a few of you were already born then. With Illumina, it allowed people to parallel sequence, parallel sequence, not just one DNA fragment not two DNA sequence, not two DNA fragments, like with the Sanger method. It allowed people to sequence hundreds, thousands, and up to a million sequences at the same time. And the method is pretty much the same, although here you had DNA fragments attached to a solid matrix. It was bound, these, these different DNA fragments were attached to uh, solid matrix matrices, and it was sort of like a microscope chip. So if you imagine microscope chips, and these chips had thousands, millions of these different sequences attached to them like that. And then a similar method like the uh, Sanger method was used. You uh, just simply added a compound like our DDA, the D-dioxy. Make that green again. This was then attached. So you got a green bit here. And maybe on another sequence, you had here, here, here. So this would be A for the other sequence. It would be a G, G, something like that. So that was the first base. It couldn't attach anything else. And now what happened was that an incredibly high resolution camera took a picture of this microscope slides of all the colors uh, on this microscope slide, took a picture, then 
the dye was in a chemical reaction was cleaved off. The DNA was still bound. The dye was cleaved off and the terminator that prevented addition like in the Sanger method, was also cleaved off. So it made the second place uh, free then, and we could start the cycle again, and the camera would take another picture. So for each cycle, the camera took a picture of these thousands and thousands microscopic dots, and then a computer just simply put these DNA pictures, these uh, these light pictures together and came up with a parallel sequence of thousands and thousands and thousands of DNA sequences at the same time. I like it, yes. Hasta la vista. I'll be back, baby. So that was Illumina sequencing. And the uh, in 2000 and... Uh, seven, I think, the uh, Illumina presented James Watson, James Watson, with his DNA sequence, and it was estimated that this was around worth one million dollar that the sequencing of uh, the DNA sequence of James Watson cost. If you compare that to the 500 million for the first genome, it's gone down dramatically. We are now uh, entering another era where this next generation sequencing is replaced by another method. which is called the Oxford uh, nanopore sequencing. And this uses a totally different system. Uh, for the Illumina sequencing, you needed uh, these very high throughput uh, sequencing machines and they were they are the initially they are very very expensive they are about uh, 500,000 uh, US dollars uh, in in the first place but then you can do loads and loads of sequencing you need a lot of chemicals and reagents uh, for that and you need this incredibly powerful camera and computers to to get this done and you brought the uh, cost down to about, uh, well, I would say it's about 10,000 uh, US dollars now per whole uh, genome. But people said, we want it cheaper. And this Oxford nanopore technology makes use of a completely different system. This is actually described in this video uh, that... Uh, you will find a link to in the slides on Moodle, so definitely worth watching. This Oxford nanopore technology is actually looks like a large USB stick. So USB stick that you can buy. You can actually attach that to your laptop and it has a sort of an area where you add your sample that you want to sequence here. You turn this thing on and it starts the sequencing with these nanopores uh, using uh, electronic devices in this USB stick. And the sequence that uh, is determined will be directly sent to your laptop where you can uh, assemble it with specific uh, programs. It, it, it looks exactly like a USB stick and it has USB connectivity. And 
with this thing, it is now possible to do a whole genome sequence of basically any organism that you want for less, far less than a thousand US dollars. And in fact, actually, uh, what uh, you can do is you can do that. You don't need big sequencing. You can do that in the middle of the jungle, for example, with this uh, Oxford nanopore technology. So it's absolutely extraordinary what we now can do. Uh, there was a uh, competition in, I think, 2007 uh, that somebody who comes up with the first human genome sequence is for less than a thousand um, dollars to be done within 24 hours will earn a prize money of one million US dollars. But I'm afraid you won't get that money because that has long been claimed. We now can do a full human genome. Um, no, it's all gone. We can do a full human genome now roughly for five, six hundred, maybe even less uh, within 12 hours. That's absolutely extraordinary. But of course, this just gives us the genome. What we really want to do is we also want to understand not just what is possible for an organism to produce in terms of transcripts or something like that. This is what the genome says. So this is the genetic information. We want now to go one step further. We want to analyze which genes are actually expressed. And this is what people came up with a method of real time qPCR or RT qPCR. Um, not really happy about this real time because when we are looking at transcripts uh, at uh, RNA, what is the RNA that these cells are producing? Uh, we are also making use of uh, a biological uh, method, which is called reverse transcription. You've heard about reverse transcription? Yes, so I don't have to really uh, tell you what it is. What reverse transcription does is it takes the mRNA, it takes the mRNA, a particular mRNA in this uh, case, and uh, converts that into a cDNA, into a copy DNA of this particular gene. And then with the help of PCR, and quantitative, that's the Q, that stands for quantitative. Quantitative PCR, you can measure how many transcripts are actually present in this organism of a particular gene. And again, uh, watch this video that gives you a really good insight in how uh, real-time uh, qPCR works in order to measure transcripts. So we are now in a position where we can measure the concentration of, for example, a virus in uh, virus RNA in uh, bodily fluids, which is exactly what the principle that we are using at the moment. But wouldn't it be nice not only to measure one transcript, not only like with a DNA where we sequenced one gene, wouldn't it be great if we could sequence, if we could measure, I should say, if we could measure thousands, tens of thousands of transcripts at the same time, wouldn't that be great? Well, actually, yes, we can. This is 
called single cell sequencing and uses the technology of what is called RNA sec. And in RNA sec, you take single cells, individual cells, and use basically this Illumina technology for these individual cells. You rewrite them into the, the mRNA into cDNA. And for each single cell that you use, you do a basic RNA cDNA sequencing of them. So you get a transcription profile of every single cell and you can do 20,000, 100,000, up to a million cells at the same time with all their transcripts. At, uh, and that is at the moment, that is possible. So we can look at individual cells, what is their transcript profile? And I think that's absolutely extraordinary. So you could easily discriminate between, let's say, uh, uh, a CD4 cell and a CD8 cell, or both are cells of the immune system, and look at their transcript profile. Why would we want to do that? Because it gives us incredibly important information which genes are switched on, turned off in different cells under different conditions. So we can, for example, look at what is the consequence of a COVID-19 infection on individual cells of the immune system. Does that make sense? So this is an incredibly powerful uh, technology that uh, is currently being developed. It is not cheap, but as you have seen, the really great thing is the, the price has come down massively from 1 billion US dollars for the first human genome to uh, about a thousand dollars 25 years later, a million fold down the prices. So an incredibly interesting, powerful new technology that is coming up. But then, of course, we have a massive problem. We need to store all this information. How do we store this information? 20,000 or 100,000 cells, each expressing, say, 10,000 different genes at different levels. How do we store this information? Well, actually, in 1964, a Russian scientist proposed, why don't we use, instead of massive hard drives, why don't we use DNA? Because DNA can actually store incredible amount of information. Uh, it is estimated that uh, in uh, the size of um, a lump of sugar of pure DNA, you would be able to store all the information that has ever been created in the human history. Imagine that. Uh, a tiny speck of DNA can hold your entire genome. <laughs> this is what happens in a cell. So can we actually build micro, can we actually build computers that use DNA as, if you like, as a hard drive? And the answer is yes, we can. We can produce synthetic DNA 
And this synthetic DNA is actually the information, contains the information for whatever you want, for a cat gift. You can store information uh, that uh, contains, you know, all the work of Shakespeare in DNA. You have DNA computers. And at the moment, it is very, very expensive. The sequencing of this information to get the information back is not expensive because I showed you we have the technology, we have the Illumina, we have the next generation sequencing, we've got the Oxford nanopore technologies. We can get, we can read this. You could do gaming in DNA, absolutely. This, these are the next big things. The big uh, stumbling block at the moment is to produce the DNA sequence that has exactly the information that you want. And at the moment, writing one mega, one megabyte information will cost you around one million pound. So for writing one megabyte of information, this will cost one million pound. But it is possible. There's proof of concept that we can do that. And if you think about it, 15 years ago, it cost one million US dollars to sequence the human genome. Now we are down to less than thousand uh, pound. This will take place very, very quickly. And DNA computing is coming. It's already there. Make no mistake. We need to store it. This is actually a fantastic uh, video uh, that you find on these slides. Definitely worth watching because it shows you what is possible. So could you hide code in someone's DNA? That's an interesting question. Now, first of all, with all this information that we have, with all these transcripts, and I will come back to this, uh, to, to, to your question, Charlotte, in a minute. Um, with all these uh, transcripts that we have, imagine you have 20,000 genes, 25,000 genes, who knows how many genes there are, each producing different transcript profiles. Now, we want to see how these, transcript, how these transcripts change, how these genes actually interact with each other. The genes give rise to the proteins. The proteins do something in the cells. It is an incredibly complicated network. So how do we make sense of that? Well, if we've got the information of, let's say, uh, somebody, let's say somebody sequenced with diabetes and compare that to somebody who doesn't have diabetes. We can compare the transcripts and we want to make sense of that. And who better to make sense of that than computers with, and that's the next big thing that's coming, AI, artificial intelligence. At the moment, there are many companies coming out, uh, for example, Shivom, where you, where these companies look at the individual DNA sequences of real people and 
analyze the, for example, genetic diseases, the potential risks for, uh, let's say, breast cancer. Think about Angelina Jolie. These companies take your DNA and analyze it and try to make a prediction about what food you should eat, what kind of exercise you should do, whether you should have children or not. So I think this is absolutely extraordinary and it can only be done with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And of course, it comes with a lot of issues. How do you make sure that everything is sort of kosher, that everything is, that nobody messes with the DNA, that these data centers don't modify the DNA? How can we make sure? How can we make sure that people people's privacy is not violated when these companies analyze the DNA, when researchers look at the uh, uh, DNA. We don't want Brave New World becoming a reality. So how can we avoid that? Well, the next big thing is blockchain, where DNA is actually uh, encoded or the databases for DNA. And we are talking about enormous databases, setabytes, petabytes of data being encrypted with blockchain, like Bitcoin. It is like Bitcoin, and you've heard about Bitcoin, uh, where basically the information is highly encrypted what would you use as an encryption code? Of course, you would use DNA again, because that is an enormous, incredibly secure code. Absolutely right. Yeah, you, you are totally right. Uh, and um, so, with blockchain, you can encrypt the information, but at the same time, you can make the transactions uh, publicly available so that everybody can scrutinize what is going on with a particular DNA. So the encryption would be to protect the privacy of uh, people for their own DNA, but at the same time, with the blockchain technology, uh, everybody has access to this DNA and can carry out analysis, but they can't modify the, the DNA. So I think there's lots and lots of massive technology coming out. Um, and again, there are uh, new companies like, for example, Gentix, These are companies that combine uh, blockchain technology with the newly found sequencing power of DNA. And this is something I can't even foresee what will happen in the next uh, 10, 15 years. And I think it's absolutely extraordinary. And yes, we will stay human. Definitely, we will stay human, but we will get so much information about ourselves, how genes interact with each other, what you should do when you have this particular gene, what you shouldn't eat when you have this gene, how should you exercise. All these personalized information will be available and hopefully it will be secured uh, so that nobody can uh, misuse it. And I think this is an incredibly exciting prospect. Uh, so watch this space. There is lots and lots of new technology coming out and it's going to be totally, totally exciting. Now with that, my time is up and uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you found that interesting, although it might be a little bit scary.
but I think this is just you are doing the you are studying the right topic and you are at the forefront of massive massive uh, revolutionary social society changing breakthroughs. So thank you very much. And for those of you who do a PS308, I see you, uh, I think, two to three uh, later, where we discuss, yeah, other interesting things. So thank you very much and see you later. Bye.